Hello everybody, welcome to the I Am IT Geek YouTube channel. My name is Shabazz Dan, I am the IT Geek. A bit of a different video, this is actually my, my first ever podcast uh, I'm, I'm doing. Uh, and for such a momentous occasion, you, you need a, a momentous guest. Um, so this, this month is all around uh, Veeam integration with Microsoft Cloud. So I'm very lucky and very, very honored to have with me uh, Michael Cade from Veeam. Hi, Michael. Hey, Shabazz. How's it going? Oh, that was a hell of an introduction, mate. <laughs> well, I think it has to be, mate. So this is my first uh, sort of podcast uh, video that I'm doing. And uh, yeah, I think within the Veeam community, especially and, and, and wider communities, as, as we'll discuss soon, um, you're quite a well-known name. So uh, I really appreciate you coming on. So thank you very much. Um, for those uh, few users that might not know who you are, if you could just please give us a quick introduction as to your role around Veeam and, and what you kind of your job entails, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, like Shabazz said, so Michael Cade, um, I'm a senior global technologist here at Veeam. I've been here for about five and a half, fastly approaching six years now, where I started as an SE. Um, background around storage and virtualization in general, but moved to, moved to Veeam five and a half years ago. Community has been something that has been massive for me in not only, I believe, getting me into the position that I'm in, but also I like to obviously now or, and all the way through is being able to give back that into the community. If I write a lot of blog posts over at vzilla.co.uk, I always say that if it just helps one person, then that's well worth putting that, that blog up there. Um, Lots of social media stuff around Twitter, generally tech related. Uh, although I think we're all going a bit, bit crazy, stir crazy with uh, uh at the moment. So yeah, there could be some other stuff in there as well with pictures of animals. I think I've been um, on my walks is that I've been <laughs> been taking some random pictures. But yeah, so that's me. Um, any questions that regarding Veeam, I should be able to help from a from a, over social media obviously LinkedIn all the usual places if I, I get a lot of questions from a lot of different places you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily uh, expect but yeah that's me Shabazz. Excellent thank you thank you for that introduction and um, for those people that are watching um, obviously when the recording goes up the Michael's um, all his kind of social media handles and, and, and YouTube he's got his own YouTube page as well and um, that'll all be in the description so all your links will be in there so people can obviously check you out uh, so yeah, it, like I said, it has been a very, very strange uh, year. Um, I think f we were just chatting off off offline about the um, about how obviously you cut travel so much within your role uh, at Veeam, and obviously that's kind of gone away over the last six to, to twelve months. Yeah, I think obviously going going to event from an event to an event, and sometimes not even going home in between. Yeah. Breakout sessions here, there, and everywhere jumping on a plane, living on a plane, that, to then go back to have to, well, how do we get that message across? How do we start to to still enable the technical community on what we're doing out there? So, yeah, that's been a, a learning curve, definitely for, for our team um, within Veeam, but I think everyone's adapted really well from it. I think that's a, and obviously this isn't the point of the, the podcast, either Shabazz for today, but I think, as an IT community or an IT industry, we're quite lucky anyway, right? We, we've got the devices, more than enough devices, I'm sure, and that ability to just work remotely. We generally work remotely anyway. We're all set up. We know, we already knew about Zoom. We knew about yeah. Teams. We knew about the platforms that we use. And yeah, I, I think that was the easy button for us. I think there's a lot of wider, there's a, a lot of, wider friends and family that potentially had had more of a struggle to to adapt 100 percent, yeah 100 percent, right um so it was funny that i think we first actually met at a community event um was a few years ago now but it was a a, 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 a veeam of a, a veeam user group down in london that uh, the, the place i was working for at the time sponsored and that was the first time we ever met yeah uh, so i, I think remember I, I did a session there and I, I keep meaning to go back to it because so it's talking about Veeam Availability Orchestrator. Right. And that was way back when it had first come on come on the on the street, if as it were. And I was looking at, well, how do I use this engine to do something else? And I think I was 
orchestrating direct restore to Microsoft Azure, like a disaster recovery type type way. And I know we're going to get into a bit more around that later, but yeah, I need to I need to pick that up because VAO is or yeah VAO has got a a bit of a lick of paint over the last few years, and it's now I think we're version three, maybe even version four coming shortly. Yeah. So, so I mean. My experience of, of Veeam has mainly been um, with backup and replication for on-premises workloads. That's kind of that's where I started off doing on-premises. Um, like most people, obviously, cloud yeah. uh, has probably been more recent um, than, than obviously on-premises. Um, and more recently, I did some stuff around Veeam for Microsoft 365, so the SaaS workloads. However, I know Veeam have actually done a lot over, especially over the last year, um, and done a lot of development around Microsoft Cloud. Um, so what, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I think it's fair to say, and even 2020 wasn't, 2020 has been a, well, was a, like a, a, a leapfrog into people moving their workloads into the public cloud, right? Whether it was Microsoft, but a lot across the board, it was like a, an acceleration of move. We've got, a, we've got this opportunity to move into, move into the public cloud because those four walls of the data center were no more, the people in the offices were gone. Um, now, even prior to that, I think at the back end of 2019, beginning of 2020, we we actually created a product, released a product called Veeam Backup for Microsoft Azure, which was really focusing on um, Microsoft Azure virtual machines, so IaaS, IaaS protection within within Azure. In an agentless way, using the APIs exposed via from Microsoft to be able to get those those nice clean clean backups of that, and we're going to leverage the storage system that Azure offers out as a short term snapshot, so a really fast recovery point, and then we tear that off into Microsoft Azure Blob Storage, and then to go back to your point around the majority of people absolutely are Veeam back and replication, and I would strongly believe that still today that is that is the majority of our customer base but they they're definitely turning into this hybrid approach where they're starting to look into and picking their picking their cloud picking their like microsoft azure and what what we do with that s3 or sorry that object storage that blob storage is you've got the ability to uh integrate that into veeam back and replication and see that as an external repository so you could start to bring the workloads back on premises. We've also got some other stuff that allows you to get your workloads into Azure very easily. So we're hopefully completing the wheel when it comes to moving data, having that portability of data. Yeah, excellent. Uh, you, you touched on storage there. Uh, so storage is obviously a huge part of, of backing up your workloads, uh, as you need you need obviously repositories to store your, your jobs and, and your data, your replication data, for example. What can you tell us about the uh, what like the different tiers um, around Azure Blob Storage and the benefits of utilizing that, that type of cloud storage for your backup workloads? Yeah, so so this goes back as well. So across the board, a big focus of probably again the last two years has been around object storage in general. So for those familiar with Veeam, you would have you may or may not know that in Veeam Backup Replication we have our scale out backup repository, and that that is a real tiered approach to where you store the data. So on-premises, you have your performance tier. Generally speaking, it's going to be close to your environment. It's going to be where you keep 7, 14, 30-day type retention for really, really fast recovery. But then you might have regulations, reasons, needs to be able to still keep data, have a retention that you need to keep off that potential or more expensive performance tier. And then we can start to tear that out into cheaper, deeper, and more accessible storage. So that first tier, after so the performance tier, then we drip down or copy into something called the capacity tier, which is where the Azure Blob Storage comes in. So this wants to be the the hottest tier within there because think about that as thirty day plus or seven day plus, like that sort of time frame, and then. In version 11, actually, we bring out an archive tier. So that's when we start to take advantage of the real cold, the colder um, Azure Blob storage and be able to archive into that, which from a recovery point of view, it's going to take a, a relatively, 
well, a bit longer to bring that data back. Um, potentially cost as well alongside that. But this is, I think we're, I think Rick, Rick Van Over actually coined the term write once, hopefully read never. But we have to keep it in terms of, or you have to keep it as customers just to settle auditors for regulation and that sort of thing. But hopefully once it gets there, it might be 180 days plus. Like we don't, we'll never hopefully ever have to touch that, but we just need to keep it because that's the that's the business. So yeah. then on top of that, so object storage, so that's Veeam backup replication really, that's the scale out backup repository. So kind of the, the, the main flagship product, if you will. Then Veeam backup for Office 365, so I know we'll t I think we'll touch on this later as well, Shabazz. But the ability to directly back up your Office 365 data into object storage, namely one of those being Azure Blob Storage, without any real requirement for local or on-premises disk, is another huge benefit of of being able to leverage um, object storage there. And then obviously the in-cloud product, the the IaaS protection that's going to tear off into object storage as well so lots of focus around object storage for us across the park not just in azure but a lot of work has been done with with microsoft around azure blob storage excellent and it, it, you touched on the the expense or the, the commercial aspect of, of storage traditionally has always you know i know traditionally cloud has always been perceived as a very expensive uh, storage uh, method, but especially with the object storage now and the different tiers, it becomes a lot more commercially feasible for your kind of smaller to medium businesses, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, and the one thing I'd add, so going back to that scale out backup repository, one of the things that we did or we could have done like a few years ago was the ability to just take those backup files and dump them into object storage, like big, big files, dump them in there and tick in the box for a lot of RFPs, right? Um, that wasn't how we approached it. One of the things that we do is, well, how can we make it more cost effective for everyone, not just the enterprise who potentially do feel that the cloud is is cost effective and everything works there. Whereas when you get down to SMB and mid-market and mid-market or commercial, then you've potentially got to be a little bit more understanding of requirements and cost and limitations from that so one of the things that we did we actually so we'll never send the same block of data up there twice so we have a we have a that understanding we we take everything down we chunk everything up into variable block block sizes so that we're actually everything is object orientated we send we leverage metadata in a huge way so that we can understand what those chunks of data look like and the metadata lives in the object storage with the data as well as on premises in that performance tier so that if you lose either you've always got access to what those chunks are but also the biggest part of being able to do that means that if we were just to take that big backup file and throw that into object storage if we ever have to recover anything from that maybe it's just one file from a virtual machine, um, we would have to bring back everything, which is, again, that's going to cost you a lot of egress charge. Wow. It's going to cost you a lot of time. So what we've done is by putting it into these smaller, very small blocks, it means that we know where, which blocks, which chunks we need to bring back so that we could be very efficient when it comes to egress charges as well. So that's a huge part of the, especially the image-based backups that we that we use and send up to, to object storage. Definitely. I guess you just touched on something else there as well, which is like the high availability. Sorry, and, and the sort of um where as, as on premises, um my my own experience is you have your your kind of repositories, but that's one place, that's one piece of storage. You know, um with with the sort of cloud storage, you've got the high availability capabilities. So if you do for whatever reason, some storage becomes unavailable. You've actually got another copy of it in yeah. a different zone somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and so that's all supported out of the the obviously that's just Azure sending blocks of data across the across the well wherever that needs to be in the different yeah. availability zones. But um, also with that, 
that then opens the door to let's say you did have the worst <laughs> catastrophic event happen in your in your loca in your office where your main systems are your main backups are and you your only good copy of data is what you've sent to object storage we've then got the ability to be able to spin up a beam backup replication server within azure connect that to the capacity tier and then start performing direct recovery into azure as azure vms even if the source even if your environment was vsphere or or Hyper-V on-premises, or even yeah. or anything really, physical machines, we've got the ability to recover those into Azure VMs, which then just means that you're back up and running as, as fast as possible from that. Yeah, I mean, again, we're going to touch on BCP later, but yeah, that, that, that example there is a perfect BCP sort of uh, plan for a business there. It's kind of ideal. Um, so this is actually, and I've not seen this service before, or I'd, I'd read about it a little bit, but... Um, what can you tell us more about Veeam PN uh, for Microsoft Azure and the benefits that this brings? So Veeam, P Veeam PN, and no pun intended, I think there was a pun intended to be fair, <laughs> because ultimately it is a VPN connection. Right. And I think what you're referring to is Veeam PN for Microsoft Azure is probably a, 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 a yep. marketing title over something, a pro this product. One is free. Uh, ultimately, it is just a VPN connection. So you have a site to site, each site, client to server. You deploy your VPN appliance. It's available in Azure. Uh, hence, you saw that in the marketplace. Yeah. But you can, you, it really, you can deploy it on any system anywhere. Wow. And ultimately, what that brings is the ability to connect sites to sites. So in that failure scenario that I just mentioned, let's say that only half of your site went down or you lost virtualization hosts, at, but you don't have the capacity to run the remaining half that, and the other half on the, on the leftovers. So now we need to think about, okay, how do we get those critical systems back up and running? Well, what you could do is you could have VPN on premises, VPN running in Azure, directly restore all of your backups into Azure VMs, and they will bridge the gap between so that you ultimately just stretched your network yeah. out. I mean, it's a free product. It was kind of a project in there. It's given us some talking points. I would probably not say how scalable it is. I think there's other solutions out there that would give you that a better a better VMP, like a VPN type type experience, but it's there. Yeah. But especially for SMB, I think SMB is the sweet spot for that. Yeah. Is that basically you pay for, you pay for the image. It's a free product from Veeam. You can download it yourself. I use it. I I literally use it when I'm away as my VPN as my VPN client. Mm -hmm. And I have I have the the server running in an Azure instance in the UK, and it just means I can get all my Netflix wow. via the from back home rather than having to uh, like pay for a VP VPN basically. But I think what you just said there around it being, a, you know, for, for business, smaller to medium businesses that like I said, maybe don't have the commercial backing to have maybe another type of VPN product. Um, it's, it's, it's ideal because like I said, it's, it's free. It gets you that connection from either site to site or even into Azure, and especially the, the sort of times we're living in at the moment with everything being remote. I'm sure there's been a lot of IT managers that have had to get things up and running very quickly, and it's been what better way than a free, a free service like that? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, uh, like there's been there's not been really that much content out there. I know, like myself and Anthony Spateri, it was his one of his products that he looks after. Um, so I know that he's he's done quite a lot of walkthroughs, and uh, yeah, there's been slow slow development for it but obviously it's not a, a paid for product it's just there to help the community really yeah exactly which again is is is, is an amazing thing especially at the moment um one product i've had a lot of um especially when, in, when i was working for the msp a few years ago um i had a lot of uh focus on beam cloud connect uh so it's, i used it a lot uh, especially for um, for businesses, and we hosted uh, for them to back up their their 
workloads with without our data center. What can you tell us about the Azure hosted version of uh, Veeam Cloud Connect? And it, I believe it's got a couple of different versions uh, and you know the benefits for the service provider. Yeah, so, so for those not familiar with Veeam Cloud Connect, this is where you can basically as a service provider or as an MSP, you can offer a backup as a service or a DR as a service, so a replication as a service or just a dumping grant, like a, a backup target um, storage. So obviously for, for many M MSPs out there that, that are out there, they have their own infrastructure, they have their own colo, they run their own data center, they have some maybe some spare storage. It's quite simple for them to just spin up a, a Windows machine, install Veeam and start offering that as a service. Now, if you are a reseller that have no has no infrastructure, has no um, data center, what um, and you're not, I would hope that you wouldn't just go out and buy a data center space, all of the hardware off the back of potentially making some money off of a value added service of being able to provide backup as a service to your potential customers. That seems a little bit risky. So what what the 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 um, image that you see in the marketplace on Azure, that's focused at those MSPs or those resellers wanting that needs or that are exploring that that potential requirement of a service to really spin something up in a in a cloud based model at a very small scale to be able to see how it looks before it then gets moved out into potential investment for local on-premises. So, uh, and in terms of versions, um, Shabazz, so Veeam Backup Replication is the underbelly of Veeam Cloud Connect. It's the same software. So versions might be on there. I th you might find Cloud Connect Enterprise on there as well, Cloud Connect Service Provider. Um, the, the, the Enterprise one is, is really quite interesting and again these have been there for a while and these have been offerings for a while basically if you're a large company that acts like a service provider basically you want to uh, have some chargeback or be able to run your departments like their tenants then cloud connect enterprise could be a good fit for that because it allows you to centrally manage all of these these incoming backups but then you've got the ability to then report against that and, and charge back against that into these specific departments. Same code base, looks exactly the same, apart from one says, I think one says tenant and one says department. It's very much a, a, a wording, but ultimately it's it's the same same product, basically. Excellent. Um, so some, I think I mentioned this when we spoke earlier, but for, for myself anyway, my earliest um, sort of cloud integration with Veeam was um, Veeam for Azure and Veeam for Microsoft 365, um, which I think it's fair to say were probably the, the two earlier probably workloads that, that, that kind of Veeam had with Microsoft integration. Um, what can you tell us about some of the more latest developments around uh, both the Veeam SaaS and the Veeam Infrastructure as a Service services? Yeah, so SaaS in particular. So we we put we've put a massive focus over the last i want to say since 2018 around beam uh, beam backup for office 365 or microsoft office 365 and obviously that starts with mail because if you're using that you're most pretty much 100 percent you're going to be using the mail offering the mail online then we branched into sharepoint online and onedrive for business to be able to protect those workloads then lots of performance enhancements, scalability enhancements. Then it was the ability to not only back up to some disk on premises or wherever you decide to put that to disk, but also go directly to object storage as a choice. Um, and then more recently, as much as we protected Microsoft Teams in previous versions, because ultimately the, the data is spread between Exchange, SharePoint and even OneDrive, um, what we what we actually wanted was a, a better way of being able to recover that data back into Teams. So that was the, the most recent. So version five was the most recent release. I believe I'm still not back into this new year, but I believe it was just before Christmas. But so that was 
so we're now on version five. And another thing to add is so Veeam Backup for Microsoft Office 365 is is the fastest growing Veeam product, which when you think about we're 13 years old going into the 14th year or, or 14th year going into the 15th. And we started life as focusing on virtualization backup. And now our fastest growing product is something that protects a SaaS based workload. Um, that either shows that the adoption rate has gone through the roof, which we know from 2020 is absolutely the case, but also that we have a lot of trusted customers out there that see what we do from a virtualization point of view, and it's just a great fit to be able to then start using us for protecting their SaaS based workloads because they're not linked. These, these are completely separate products. They don't talk to each other in any way. So yeah, there's 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 that to to um so even if you're not a, an existing Veeam back and replication customer, you don't need to be. You can still protect your your Office 365 workloads with a separate product. So that that's funny you should say that. A lot of the conversations I was having um, historically when I when I was working for the MSP was. Uh, it was existing Veeam customers, and they'd say, well, you know, they'd be, because I was more cloud focused, it'd be like, okay, they want to migrate their Exchange workloads on premises into Microsoft Exchange Online. Uh, and they'd be backing up using Veeam on premises. And, and, and I'd be like, well, what are you going to do to back up on, you know, in cloud? And they'd be like, well, it's, it's already Microsoft deal with it. Well, no, 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 they don't. No, they don't. And it's, it's a massive misconception that they did that. And it was so easy to say, well, actually, you know, Veeam, the product you already use, they have a different piece of a different service to back up exchange and it'd lead into that conversation and again because they'd already used veeam it was a very easy conversation to have yeah yeah for sure sorry i've got frog in my throat um so most of the services that we've been talking about today have been based on uh, backing up your resources and, and restoring them however another massive area and for businesses uh, is being able to replicate your workloads and, and have that sort of BCP. Uh, and, and already in the conversation, you mentioned two different scenarios. Um, and I know there's, there's a heck of a lot more. Um, what can you tell us more about uh, you know, direct restoring to Azure and disaster recovery in cloud using Veeam? Yeah, so one of the, the key differentiators, one of the key differentiators for Veeam, from a technical point of view, no marketing, is the portable data format. So if you think any, any image based backup that we take, so whether it's from Hyper-V, from VMware, from Nutanix HB, from physical Windows, physical Linux, using our agents, anything from cloud based products from Azure, from uh, AWS, from Google, they all back up into this .vbk format and then incrementals into .vibs or reverse into VRBs. Ultimately, think of that like a zip file, a compressed file that you might have created back in 2008 on a Windows Vista machine. In fact, don't use that. Let's use a let's use a stable operating system. But, but ultimately, we could take that zip file today put it in onto a Windows 10 machine and you could open that up. Same if you took that zip file and you open, you put it onto a Mac or a Linux machine, you could still open it. It's, it's agnostic to where, one, where it lands, where it lives, so on the storage, but also it's agnostic to the operating system and the software will always be able to open that file. Now I come back to the VBK format, well, that's exactly the same case for our VBK. So think about it as a file system within a file system. It's where we store everything that we need. So metadata is in there, all of the parts of the, the disks that, of the machines that we're protecting, they're all in there. So we've got a pretty good construct of that. Now that VBK can live wherever we want. We've already touched a lot on object storage. It can live there. It could live on a dedupe appliance. It could live on some direct attached storage, some NAS. It really doesn't matter, like completely agnostic to wherever it lives. Granted, some will perform better than others, but it doesn't matter. Now, the, the thing that we've really been working on over the last few years is that ability or that mobility of those workloads. So regardless of where it came from, we've got the ability to recover it into any location. So 
instantly we can recover those workloads, regardless of where they come from, into vSphere or Hyper-V on-premises. So where, even if it's come from the cloud, we can instantly recover it into vSphere or Hyper-V, which is great because as much as Hyper-V is not very high on everyone's list, but every Windows server anywhere can be a Hyper-V machine, even if it's temporary which is huge, especially in the SMB when you're clawing to find the resource, especially when things are on fire and you need to fix things quick. But then on the same, in the same light of that, how about being able to directly restore those, any of those workloads into Microsoft Azure and AWS? And that process is not instant. There's the laws of physics because we have to get the data up into the cloud. And obviously your mileage will vary depending on what that link speed is up into up into Microsoft Azure. And uh, what we're doing is we're taking that VBK format, we're going through the motion, we're converting that, that machine into an Azure VM. So you choose which Azure, uh, like which size machine you want, how much RAM, CPU, what disk you want it to live on, what the networking looks like, what the... Um, security groups etc what that all looks like and then that will start that that processing moment into into microsoft azure so then at the end of that you've got your machine so what we the reason why you mentioned around the replication so some people have used that as a way of being able to recover workloads after on-premises has gone bad now don't get me wrong the laws of physics state that obviously you have to get that data up there however we can do it from the object storage as well. So we could do it from the capacity tier that is already in Azure. So then that reduces your time to get that machine back up and running. Um, another big use case, especially this year, has been around test and development, like being able to take those machines or group of machines, and we're going to send a copy of them up into Azure. We're going to work on them all day in, in this isolated network, and then we're going to bin them off at the end of the day. And then you've got just file recovery migrations, people are using this to migrate their workloads into Azure. But yeah, there's there's a there's quite a few areas to 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 jump on from from that point of view, from those features. There's a word that you've used a few times, the agnostic. That that is so important in uh, in any service or product that it allows because that allows you know, the, the customers who who use Beam to, they don't have to be like, and obviously I'm focusing on Microsoft Cloud because that's that's my piece. But you know, AWS, Google Cloud, vSphere, Hyper-V, Veeam covers them all, Linux, Windows, Mac. And for me, that's a massively important uh, service because again, it just it opens it up to so many customers. And for the product to have that agnostic agnosticity is probably the right word. But uh, <laughs> if it isn't, I apologize. But that, that's a real that's really important. I feel. Yeah, yeah, and it's been something that we've constantly thrived towards. Like, so being a yes, we partner with a lot of different storage vendors, both primary and secondary storage vendors. And yes, there are bells and whistles on some of those that allow us to do things faster and better, and all of that good good stuff. But really, it can just be a server full of disk, store your data there. It's uh, or it could be us backing it up from a, a server that's running Linux, that's running Windows, that's in vSphere. It really doesn't matter. We, we'll protect it. And being agnostic does allow us to do so much more, both from a, a backup perspective, but also from a recovery and recovering wherever we're recovering to because of that port, portable data format. I think it's safe to say as well, that's probably one of like that, that agnostic approach is probably one of the reasons why Veeam is, how many times, every year you seem to be the, the fastest growing uh, yeah. vendor. Um, I'm always seeing like a, an announcement or something that you know we've grown the fastest growing vendor um, every year. So I think that's probably one of the reasons, isn't it? Yeah, and a lot of it is is choice, right? Is that so? There's a lot in that product now, especially like so. I, like I say, I've been here five, nearly six years, and that product since version eight that was, or just on the cusp of version seven, that product has changed so much, and now where we were just focused on virtualization and now we've got a whole platform of products to be able to look after point solutions in azure 
or in AWS in the cloud. Yeah. We've got our on. We've obviously not stopped doing what we do on premises, and then also things like NAS backup, being able to look after agents and being able to look after just different workloads. Like big, big focus, big purchase, big acquisition at the back end of last year was with Caston, who focus on Kubernetes. So being able to protect AKS and and workloads like that in a similar fashion to what we we started out doing back in the virtualization days, these guys recognize that and they started doing, they, they've got a solid solid um, software platform to be able to protect Kubernetes. And again, they follow that same mentality of being agnostic, whether it's AKS today, EKS, et cetera, it doesn't matter. If it's Kubernetes, the APIs are there, we can protect it. So that's another, that's kind of the, the advance and where 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 we're broadening that platform now um i personally found in 2020 um automation with cloud was was huge and it was a it seems to be a massively growing area um and, and businesses want to be able to scale in scale out up and down automatically um based on certain metrics uh, i've seen that there is automation you can do with veeam using powershell uh, what more can you tell us about this yeah so so there is, there's an extensive PowerShell and that actually gets a huge, let's call it a facelift in version 11 as well, a lot lot more functionality. Um, but more to the point around automation is the APIs that are gonna also become more available in version 11. So that's gonna expose to those that want to, they can. They can. Um, like you say, some people will want to be able to do that at scale but we've already done quite a lot of work around dynamically being able to deploy and destroy proxies to be able to lift and shift that data, being able to, I did some work specifically around Azure in that that piece that I touched on is being able to spin up a Veeam backup replication server from the Azure marketplace using Azure PowerShell, spin it up with all the, all the configuration that you need, connect your capacity tier, so your Azure blob storage, and then actually kick off the the direct restore to Azure, all in one script. It's all available. The the whole. In fact, I think I went through a video demo of it as well, and it was really sure. just to highlight what what is possible, and what could be used in that that failure scenario. So, automation is is big on us. Um, whether it's day one operations or day zero operations or or beyond. There's also more stuff coming in in Veeam One from a monitoring and analytics point of view that that really hone in and just the I'd say the smaller bits, but like automating reports and being able to tell you if VMs are or machines are not being protected. I need to know that as soon as possible. But within Veeam One, you could actually create stuff that allows you to um, automatically catch all of those non-protected machine so at least you are then getting a a sort of backup and it might be once a week this catch all type thing but automating that response so you don't necessarily need a, a dedicated backup admin that backup admin can now be utilized in doing something else within the business tell you what i've been there before where, where you've got a customer that's had a bit of a, an issue you need to restore something and you realize that the one the, the server that was not being backed up for whatever reason yeah. is the one where it's gone missing. So that, that's amazing to have that automation, definitely. Uh, so um, again, we've talked a lot about some of the, the, the existing products. Um, what developments around Veeam integration with Microsoft Cloud um, can, we have, can we look forward to in the upcoming months or, or year, do you think? Is there anything on the horizon? Uh, so the one thing to talk about, and I'm not sure when, but it'll be the closest one to to this conversation, Shabazz, is Veeam Backup for Azure. So we're on version one at the moment, which is very much uh, the ability to protect via snapshots and backups the IaaS workloads within Azure. What version two brings to this, which is the on the, on the horizon version, is the ability to um, manage and deploy that from a central VBR server. So if you're a traditional Veeam server, Veeam customer, so you've got your virtualization, you've got some physical machines, you've got your data center, 
and you're just getting into the public cloud, which is, happens to be so many people, but on a daily basis we're having these discussions, what this will allow you to do is actually have visibility of that theme backup for, it, for Azure and manage it, deploy it all from that central theme backup being back and replication. Now it's still a point solution as well. You can obviously, if you are only in, in Azure, then you can absolutely do that. But it just gives you that hybrid approach, a little bit more management for that as well. Um, another thing I mentioned already around uh, V11, V11 is like our biggest launch. Happens kind of this time of year, every year. Um, biggest part of this, from an Azure perspective is the archive tier. So being able to um, store those backups for longer term retention, that write once, hopefully read never type tier. Yeah. Um, everything else is, so I'll, I'll touch on the, so Microsoft SQL. So a lot of people still run this on premises as well as obviously from a PaaS point of view. So within Veeam backup replication, I've already kind of touched on instant recovery of stuff, of workloads. Um, one of the things in V11, specifically around SQL, is that we've always had the ability to publish from the backup repository, from that backup file, a SQL database into a test and dev type environment. Yeah. So great for test and dev. They've got, they can spin up that database, they can see what it was, they can pull the data out, they can do whatever they need to do from a table perspective and be able to do what they need. But it wasn't a recovery. It wasn't recovering anything back really. Or if they were, they were taking the tables from that instance and then put, putting it back into the live production SQL box. What V11 brings is actual instant SQL database recovery. So being able to go in there and recover a SQL database directly back to the production SQL server, replaying everything. If you remember back in the day around vSphere and vMotion, um, there's a there's a slight blip between, or like a, a, an outage when you're converting that last block of data over. Yeah. That's exactly what we've done there with the switch over. So there's, there's loads of stuff happening, but that in particular is worth mentioning. There's quite a lot of stuff around certain application workloads within Azure as well that we're looking at um, via like Oracle or being able to protect it using Oracle RMAN. Just there's a lot of that. The list of stuff in V11, mate, is is ridiculous. There's so much, so much stuff. And we've got to write all the content for it. So, yeah, that's the that's the next mission. The, um, the the management thing you mentioned right at the beginning, that's huge. I just when you said that, I was quite shocked. That that's massive to be able to manage all those workloads in a hybrid <clears throat> management tool. Um, that's quite impressive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then because it's not so, then then we're looking for feedback in regards to those PaaS workloads within Microsoft Azure, so SQL um, and other workloads in there. And I think just let us know. Like that, the only thing I could ask is jump on the forums, the Veeam forum, forums.veeam.com, um, and just drop, jot in there your need, your requirement around that. And we tend to listen. That's really, Veeam has been built on listening to the, 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 the community and, and getting, it, getting that out there. So, yeah, that's all I'd ask is give us the feedback. Perfect. Um... So on your own personal community act community activities, uh, what do you have planned over the next few months? Uh, you know, what's your focus going to be around? Uh, and have you set any milestones from a learning perspective? So community wise or content wise as well, because I think they go hand in hand, yeah. is the YouTube channel. So my YouTube channel, I, I've just ticked over 350 subs. Wow. which is bonkers really because I've just been doing video demos a lot of it has been Azure based or cloud based um but not putting my head on it just my voice I was always shy about putting putting my face in the in the picture um but they were getting really good really good views um I've started a live stream there but I think a realistic goal there is that well I would love to see a thousand subs on there by the end of 2021 I think we've got another six months of this 
remote working situation. And I don't know about you, Shabazz, but I've lived on YouTube, whether it's desk setups, whether it's like every, even everyday carries and some weird and wonderful things that I've found on that. But yeah, like, like I've li- I consume all the, the training stuff that I'm doing on there as well. It's just a really good, quick and easy way of being able to consume a lot of information very quickly across the board. Um, and then from a learning point of view, I've kind of, I'm already in this like two year thing. I started something called summer, summer learning or something, maybe in 28, maybe 2019. Uh, and that focus was around public cloud or public cloud, cloud native, Kubernetes, bit of infrastructure as code, and just constantly taking, trying to take up to an hour a day and just learning something new and jotting that down. I started doing the 100 days of cloud yeah. as well, which has lacked, lacked off a bit because of other, other commitments. Right. But the good thing about it is that you're not forced to take 100 days straight to have to do something. Yeah. You can jump in, jump out, but it just makes you accountable to jump back in and do it and do something else. And the focus there really was around is around GCP, just because I haven't done much with Google Cloud Platform, or I hadn't done much. So I wanted to focus on that. Whereas I would say that from a foundational level point of view, Azure and AWS, I'm pretty good with that, especially coming from an infrastructure background. I feel that Azure is the easy, like the easy one to walk into and, and know what what they're talking about and what they're saying, yeah. but there's still so much more to learn. There's endless amounts to to learn on there. But yeah, so every day is trying to learn something new. I think that probably goes to for everyone in this this community. Um, yeah, a bit more focus around infrastructure as code as well. I really like what the guys over at HashiCorp, HashiCorp are doing around Terraform, around some of the stuff that they're doing there. Yeah, I think that'll be, that's my focus as well as obviously doing my thing at, at Veeam and keeping the content train going there as well. Of course. No, thank you. I will, uh, like I said, um, all, all um, your social links and your YouTube channel will all be in the description of the video. Um, so, and, and that's it from, from me really. I obviously had a lot of questions for you, a couple <laughs> of uh, ad hoc questions just from, from the stuff you were saying. Um, so, you know, I want to thank you very much. This is all part of my, my kind of Veeam integration series with Microsoft Cloud. Um, they, they like the, you've actually given me another idea for an additional video while you were, <laughs> while you were saying something. So thank you for that. Yeah, good stuff. So, yeah, I just want to really thank you for taking the time out. Um, uh, yeah, so thank you and, and, and good luck with everything. Thank you. Cheers, Shabazz. Thank you.